Salutations, fellow gumshoes, and welcome to another rip-roaring, rootin' tootin' good time episode of What Happened, the show where we dig deep to uncover every filthy little scandal in the entertainment world. So, you better whip out your magnifying glasses and notebooks for this one, because today's lurid tale of sin and sacrifice is the infamous behind-the-scenes story of rock star and Team Bondi's L.A. Noir, a story I like to call The Machinations of Malicious McNamara. The year is 2002. Sony Computer Entertainment has just published The Getaway, a GTA clone smattered with dry British wit that was really subtle about its cinematic influences. It was a co-production between SCE London and Team Soho, who were also based in London. It released to middling reviews, and while not poor by any stretch, it was lost in the deluge of all the GTA clones hitting all the store shelves in all of the early aughts. Enter one Brendan McNamara, a senior member of Team Soho and the director of The Getaway, who had but a handful of smaller projects under his belt that no one's ever heard of, and before you say you do, no, you don't. Upon the lukewarm reception for The Getaway, Mr. McNamara felt, for some reason, this would be a launching pad for the next step of his career. So he left Team Soho and trekked all the way to the land of Hugh Jackman's deadly everythings and the pain bush, good ol' Australia. He was also, in effect, returning to his old stomping grounds as he originally hailed from the land down under and wanted to open his own studio there. He dubbed it Team Bondi, and it was called such because it was named after Bondi Beach in Sydney. Thank you, Instant Hotel. It officially opened in 2003 with just a handful of employees that McNamara had hand poached from Team Soho, and they immediately got to work. Kinda. Very quickly, two things happened. One, a deal was struck with Sony to publish Bondi's first title, and two, McNamara opened a secondary studio, Depth Analysis, to research facial motion capture technology, which would be integral for what Bondi was working on. So you can clearly see the man was nothing if not ambitious. You know who was also ambitious? Nobunaga! The year was now 2005! Bondi's game was officially unveiled as L.A. Noir and was slated as an exclusive for the PlayStation 3. However, the team had only just received dev kits for the Cutting Edge console, so those first three years of development amounted to coding and designing in the dark, making assumptions on how powerful the final hardware would be. Statements from former members of Team Bondi, which we'll be referencing a lot, Describe this phase of development as directionless, but exciting, but also a bit frustrating. Oh, the frustration hasn't started yet. Not long after this official announcement of PS3 exclusivity, Sony Computer Entertainment became the pullout kings. You think they don't know I'm the pullout king? Rick! Yeah? Who's the pullout king? You are. That's right. <laughs> and suddenly decided they would be no longer publishing L.A. Noir. See, McNamara was betting a lot on that facial capture technology, and the budget was ballooning because of it. Not only that, but he also proposed that all the major characters would be portrayed by Hollywood actors, swelling the costs even further. Sony felt all this investment and newfangled technology from the future wasn't worth the risk if L.A. Noir failed. Thus, they dropped it from the release schedule like a newborn koala. Now, details around this time frame are a bit hazy, but L.A. Noir's 47 Packard was installed out on the freeway for long as Rockstar Games rode up in their shiny Mercedes Benz and towed it off the hot Australian asphalt. Let's not also forget, this wasn't the first time the publisher had saved what seemed like a trouble IP and turned it into an absolute blockbuster, as nothing compares to the faded chapter of the worst business decisions of all time when Capcom gave up the rights to the Red Dead IP, losing a potential billion dollar franchise in the process. After the publisher switch, the first video footage of Ellen Noir to surface out of the La Brea tar pits was a 2006 CGI trailer that gave an idea of what the player could expect in tone and atmosphere. 
a hard-boiled post-World War II open-world game where you'd play as a detective, trying to navigate the muck of LA's seedy underbelly. At the time, Rockstar would only confirm that the game was now in development for next-gen systems, and played coy about that former PS3 exclusivity. This coyness was maintained for several years for some reason. Now that the game had been properly set up with a new publisher who had experience with sandbox environments, ironic since the getaway was a competitor to GTA, it was time for work to swing into full gear. But the thing about L.A. Noir and more specifically Team Bondi, is that they only ever seemed to operate in one gear, which just so happened to be the slowest. For those not in the know, despite the detective thriller being well-reviewed in publications, highlighted some exciting new technology, and even going on to be a sales success, it also represents one of the worst examples of developmental hell ever covered here at What Happened. Most of the inside information from here on out comes from various staff members of Team Bondi, known as the Bondi Eleven, a group of former employees that banded together to speak up about the unfathomable working conditions at the Sydney-based studio. In 2011, as a follow-up to a list of credits that were not included into L.A. Noir, an IGN article was published that finally gave these employees a proper voice, as well as letting their former boss, Mr. McNamara, respond to the many, many allegations against him and his business practices. Most employees describe McNamara as a bully, one of the angriest people in the world, and someone who always wanted things done their way. His behavior was deemed so stress-inducing that it was one of the main factors that caused dozens of team members to quit Team Bondi, sometimes only after a few weeks. Many of the staff corroborate this, saying, it's one thing for him to be angry behind closed doors, but it was incredibly common for him to scream at whoever was pissing him off in the middle of the office. It was falling apart and things got violent. Yikes, so what did McNamara have to say about all this? He maintained that getting into verbal arguments were simply a part of trying to get things done. Am I passionate about making the game? Absolutely. Do you think I'm going to voice my opinion? Absolutely, but I don't think that's verbal abuse. Yes, it is. He elaborates, I can go to anyone I want. It's my game. I can go to anyone I want in my team and say, I want it changed. I've been doing it for a long time and it seems to have worked so far for me. Now, not only is screaming at employees in public kind of like incredibly unprofessional, it demonstrates a pattern as to why L.A. Noir was such a nightmare to work on. In most Western development studios, a singular director who answers to no one and micromanages everything is very rare and also not good. An excellent example of this being Georgie Boy and the Technicolor Nukem of the Dukes, the fourth. Traditionally, AAA Western games are designed by committee, a mix of producers, team leads, etc. Yes, there is usually a director or, or even several, but the point is, is that everyone keeps each other in check but not at Team Bondi. McNamara had absolute control, and his team leads would fight him on absolutely nothing. Oftentimes, he would demand unreasonable things from individual employees, such as programmers or artists, with an unrealistic deadline or something that's not even within their skill set. You better give us something, Cliff, or we're gonna make this hard on you. When said employees would then bring this up to their lead, they would simply shrug and be like, yeah, he's passionate, and then and then just go back to their work. During the entirety of the seven years of L.A. Noir's development, it was estimated that 100 different people joined and then left the company before the completion of the game. And if you're wondering, that's not great. This cycle continued for two more years, with Team Bondi making local Aussie slugs jealous of their glacial pace. Things finally started to progress at a better clip in 2008 once Rockstar had sent a few producers over to Australia, braving the drop bears and didgeridoos to try and right this expensive, leaky ship. They were well aware of the production problems plaguing Team Bondi and felt since they were publishing the title, McNamara would listen to these new transplants, which thankfully he did. 
Lots of former staff members cited these producers as the reason why the game finally started taking form, but there was one other fire that Rockstar still had to put out, however, and that was the incredibly dismal employee retention. While speaking to McNamara about his hands-on approach might have been the more long-term solution, they put a band-aid on a bullet hole and provided additional artists, programmers, and testers from other Rockstar-owned studios to fill the gaps that were popping up every single week to try and carry the load. Now, even with all these injections of fresh bodies, the team were still bleeding talent, but fortunately, or unfortunately, Australia had lots of university programs that taught game design, so the bulk of new hires at Bondi were fresh out of college looking for their big break. They weren't the only ones looking, however, because Bondi was looking to take advantage of this because the HR department established a new position for those young, doe-eyed game lovers, dubbed graduate juniors, as it would provide an excuse to pay low wages while promising a more permanent role within the company upon future performance reviews. Many didn't even last this long. A shared sentiment between almost all former employees of the LA Noir team, mostly all the Aussie hires, is that they felt like second-class citizens. Again, in the IGN expose, one of them explained further, we were looked at as a disposable resource. Basically, if you weren't in the inner circle, basically a clubhouse of former Soho members, you were just a resource to be burned through. Their attitude is, it's a privilege to work for us, and if you can't hack it, you should leave. I heard one of the upper echelons say pretty much that. I thought it was disgusting. I don't understand how they can't see that maintaining talent would actually be good for them. Now, McNamara's micromanaging madness aside, there was another reason why progress was so slow on LA Noir, and that was an additional trickle-down effect from that low employee retention rate. It always takes some time for any new team member to get up to speed with the development. The tools, the engine, just everything. So, whenever a new hire joined up, they would need weeks to acclimatize, slowing the work down even further. A particular programmer who had worked on the game recalls this problem vividly. I inherited all the stuff they worked on, and of course, once that happens, I'm quite unproductive for like a month, trying to figure out which way's up. This happened to me three or four times. I ended up inheriting four people's stuff. Now, remember those Rockstar producers? They were slack-jawed when they realized this one programmer was doing the work of four others. I was like, yeah, tell me about it, man. But when I left, I handed those four things on to somebody else, and then they hired new people too, and it just kept going. If they maintained their talent, they'd operate a lot more efficiently, and it wouldn't have taken so long. So, with an unreasonable egomaniac running roughshod over the team, the pathetic levels of employee retention, a bloated dictionary-sized script, multiple Hollywood actors doing expensive facial capture scans, L.A. Noir behind closed doors was a calamity waiting to happen. However, Rockstar couldn't just pull the plug as they had sunk, by some reports, over $50 million into the development already, and even more when taking marketing into account. So, it's soldiered on until late 2009, a good four years after they had agreed to publish. Multiple milestone deliveries have been missed by this point, and to catch up on all the monumental amount of work left to do, upper management did what upper management does when they realized everything was screwed up. They called in a problem solver, if you will. Are what happened viewers will know this problem solver well, as it's none other than the super dependable, always effective, and one of a kind, Mr. Crunch. Sure, it looks scary, but this might crunch up your confidence. Oh, but not the nice, normal American Mr. Crunch. No, no. This was the foul-mouthed, aggressive, and cruel Australian hard-ass Mr. Crunch. Now, apparently, this phase of crunch lasted from 2009 all the way to release, so that's almost two solid years of overtime and weekends. Just let that sink in. The higher-ups, and McNamara, of course, kept this unbelievable situation going by stringing along its staff, as a former artist at Bondi confirms. Even if you left at 7.30 p.m., you'd get evil eyes. The crunch was ongoing. It just kept on shifting. 
Management would say, oh, it'll finish once we meet this deadline, but the deadline kept moving too. Game companies just think that crunch can solve poor scheduling or bad design decisions made early on in a project. Another colleague cited his time at Team Bondi as the most miserable of his life. I left because of stress and working conditions, mainly, but the trigger was this. I received a reprimand for conduct and punctuality for being 15 minutes late to work. I arrived at 9.15 a.m., despite the fact I had only left work around 3.15 a.m. the previous night and paid for my own taxi home. I never would have thought you could put a sweatshop in the Sydney CBD. Local crime boss Brendan McNamara also chimed in on crunch culture. People don't work any longer hours than I do. I don't turn up at 9am and go home at 5pm and then go to the beach. I'm here at the same hours as everyone else's. <laughs> We're making stuff that's never been made before. If you wanted to do a 9 to 5 job, you'd be in another business. Or you could, you know, schedule your milestones better and not drive your employees to the edge of insanity and exhaustion. But there's another grosser, slimier layer to all this crunching that might be the most shocking of all. Team Bondi apparently stiffed almost everyone on the overtime hours they clocked in on LA Noir. No overtime was officially paid in the three years and three months that I worked at Team Bondi, a former artist admits. Apparently, staff contracts were muddled with a lot of wordage that implied that all official overtime hours would only be paid for three months after the game's completion. Not like, you know, during it. If you left the company for any reason, you wouldn't get what was due. I suppose this clause was added to keep staff members at Team Bondi, but shit. That didn't really work, did it? McNamara, as you can imagine, refutes this. There was a bonus scheme for working evenings, and people got a month off for that. And people who worked weekends got paid for it. We brought in a weekend working scheme specifically for that. Did you pay with check or cash? But contractually, we don't have to do that. Part of the thing is, is that we pay over the odds. And it says in their contract that they need to do extra time. I've done 20 years of not getting paid for doing that kind of stuff. I don't begrudge it. I get the opportunity to make things. In my business, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. The situation gets very muddy as several former employees claim there was no bonus scheme in place and that McNamara was twisting the truth during the IGN interview. Regardless, we are now limping weekly into 2010 where Rockstar finally confirmed that Ellie Noir would release in May of 2011 for the PS3 and the Xbox 360 with a PC port following a few months later. So, now is a good time to talk about one of the main aspects of the game that was left to the wayside, one crucial element that was a casualty of the revolving door of talent at Team Bondi, the open world of Los Angeles. While the game featured a meticulously recreated version of LA from the 40s, there's nothing to actually, you know, do in it. It's merely used as window dressing while you engage in long, vehicle-bound conversations with your partner. A couple blocks north of Central Station. So, what do we tell the wife? We play it by the book. There's no stiff yet, so let's see how it plays out. You often just feel like you're driving through a large, lifelike museum rather than a bustling metropolis. Now, why is this? Well, we barely had any animators for such a long time. It was crazy. People have mentioned how the open world in LA Noir is wasted because the world is so boring. The reason was because no animators wanted to work at Team Bondi. There was no lead animator from January 2008 until the end of the game, and for large parts of production, we only had one animator working on gameplay animations, and the others were doing the cinematic and facial ones. This meant that there was no way to add life to the world. It's a perfect example of why staff retention is so important, but it was ignored by the leads at Team Bondi, and the game suffered for it. To make this even simpler, there were only two forms of animation, the amazing facial motion capture and everything else and that everything else was mostly done by one person. This explains the awkward disconnect between the fluid expressions on people's faces 
and the stiff mannequin-like pumblings of their bodies. We are now in launch week of May 2011, and Rockstar did their damnedest to market the shit out of LA Noir with long gameplay videos and pre-order exclusives. Reviews were fairly high, and while criticisms were made against the unexciting open world, the ho-hum action gameplay, and some technical hiccups, the general consensus was favorable. During its first month on shelves, it managed to move just under 1 million copies across both versions, but would eventually go on to sell 5 million altogether, which, while strong, was barely enough to cover the massive budget. Furthermore, 5 million was a drop in the bucket compared to other Rockstar successes, with GTA 4 shifting 25 million copies and Red Dead Redemption 15 million just a few years earlier. Despite this encouraging success, Rockstar, however, could see no benefit to working with Bondi in the future and decided to cut all ties with them after such a long and painful development cycle. You developed such a reputation, I'm not going to be able to hold on to you any longer. Thus, a mere four months after their first and only release, Team Bondi shut down as they were unable to procure any other contracts from other publishers, as reports about their terrible studio culture and working conditions sealed their fate. Even with everything crumbling around him, Brendan McNamara had hopes that another project he had in the works would get picked up, which were then quickly dashed. Now, while not much was known about this new title, the one thing that was, was enough for most people to just steer clear of it. Horror of the Orient was going to be another cinematic adventure, but failed to find any sort of funding until it was picked up in a liquidation sale by one Kennedy Miller Mitchell, a film production company that was co-founded by George Miller of Mad Max fame. This didn't surprisingly go anywhere. There were rumors that Warner Brothers Publishing had showed some interest in it, but again, nothing official was ever fully stated and the project just simply vanished. After that, Rockstar Neri made a peep about L.A. Noir in terms of it continuing, despite representatives claimed it remained an important pillar for their studio. That silence ended in 2017, however, where much noise was suddenly made over the misadventures of one Cole Phelps. Upgraded versions of L.A. Noir were released for the PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, featuring upgraded textures, camera angles, and all the DLC, with the port being handled by Virtuous. Now, what's interesting is that L.A. Noir, the VR case files, also came out at the tail end of 2017, and while essentially just a first-person VR mod of several cases from the original title, was developed by Video Games Deluxe, the new studio founded by... Brendan McNamara! Now, usually here at What Happened, I always look forward to telling you that the not-very-nice person is no longer working within the video games industry, but this doesn't seem to be the case this time. Video Games Deluxe was searching for positions to fill up until about six months ago on LinkedIn, and things have remained quiet ever since. Cause, uh, yeah, I bet it's not the easiest thing in the world to convince Aussie game developers to jump back into the shit pit once again. It's also unclear whether Rockstar has any more tangible plans for L.A. Noir outside of ports, as it does have a definite appeal. The music, atmosphere, and core ideas are loaded with potential. It's just that the original game was so mismanaged that it just soured the whole premise. So, after all this, the hundreds of hours of unpaid overtime, the seven-year-long development cycle, the damaged lives and mental states of all the employees, would McNamara do anything differently? Well, when asked by IGN, he thoughtfully replied, I think we'd think twice about working in Sydney. There's not much government assistance compared to Canada or the US. The expectation is also slightly weird here, that you can do this stuff without killing yourself. Well, you can't. Whether it's in London or New York or wherever, you're competing against the best people in the world at what they do, and you just have to be prepared to do what you have to in order to compete against those people. Wow, Brendan, so, so that's your only regret. There's nothing else you feel you could have done better, huh? No, nothing at all. Y you know what? I believe you. I mean, I can't imagine why a man of your stature would have any sort of regrets, you know, against them. 
If you're aware of any other fantabulous failures of the video game or movie variety, jot some notes down in the comments below or sleuth your way to the dark alleys of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially vote on the next subject we tackle here at What Happened. See you next time, kids, and don't work for McNamara.